Isn't Youth Sunday fun? <laughs> so, Pastor Sean was away this, uh, this week at General Council, and uh, so I'm filling in. We wanted to uh, have somebody that could most relate to the youth, so we picked the <laughs> oldest person that we could find <laughs> on the staff. <laughs> and and it's, it's also uh, fifth Sunday, uh, fifth week Sunday, when all the, the young children stay with us instead of going to the... Uh, the kids zone. So we look for the person least likely to be brief to just to make sure that they get the full dose of what it's like to be in the, in the, in the service. Uh, no worries, Pastor Sean will be back next week. We, um, we've been looking at a series on uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And we've looked at uh, the, the reaching out to, um, to people, and particularly looking out um, to people outside the community. Right? We saw the, uh, Jesus talking to uh, the woman at the well, a Samaritan. We, we saw the parable of the, of the good Samaritan reaching out to a bruised and broken man in the street. We, we saw uh, John and, uh, going down to where there was a move of God among the Samaritans, and he went and included them in the, in the church of God. We saw a man reaching out to an Ethiopian eunuch to bring the gospel to him. We even saw a man reaching out to touch the apostle Paul, the persecutor of the church. Well, the text that we have this morning is the motive for all of these things. So I'm looking at 1 John 3.14 through 18. In your bulletin, it's really 3.18 where we're going to spend most of our time. But uh, the text, if you have a guest Bible that you picked, on your, picked up on your way in, it's on page 985. If we love our Christian brothers and sisters... It proves we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates his, another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother and sis or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? And here's our text for this morning. Dear children, let's not merely say we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. Or another translation, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Before I retired, I was, um, I was working for a, an IT, a medical IT company. And uh, we uh, stored and showed on workstations uh, radiological images, ultrasound and CTs and all the rest of it. And we, we were not doctors. We were just IT people. But we had to learn a little bit about our customers and how they use the system and what they went through it on a daily basis. And I, I remember watching a, a seminar in a real high up. I, I forget if she was a radiologist or an orthopedist or an oncologist. doesn't matter. But she was well-trained and had risen high in the, in the industry, and she was giving a speech, and she said uh, all, the, all the years of her career, she suffered, and her colleagues often suffered from what she called imposter syndrome. And the imposter syndrome, uh, if you're young with us, imposter means phony or somebody that pretends to be what they're not. Another word for a hypocrite. But the imposter syndrome was her feeling that she wasn't capable of doing the job that she was supposed to be doing. And what makes it worse is that any day now, 
people would figure it out and they would see her as the imposter that she would and it would be a shame and she'd lose her job and everything would go downhill. She doesn't even know what she's talking about when I come to a text like this, which I think is the hardest one in the series. Thank you very much, Pastor Sean. I appreciate that. But I come to read this and John calls us and he states that our lives in Christ are so much higher than mine actually is. That, that it feels like an imposter to declare what God's word is. But how many of you realize we never get to the point where we're not convicted by God's word? You may think sometimes that the one that's speaking has got it all together and we that are listening uh, are the ones that get convicted, but that is not the case. It's the one that's speaking has to uh, take full, full cognizance of what the, what the word is, is saying. And so I thought it, it might be easier just to read the entire epistle and skip my remarks. Yeah, come on, you can, <laughs> but we're not going to do that because I, I don't want to lose my job. But, but when, we, when we go through this text, we're really looking at the, at the whole epistle. And I would recommend that you spend some time just reading through it in thoughtful detail because he has a lot, a lot to tell us. But the challenge here, and I, I, I wrestled with how to approach this, so I decided to approach it through various errors, <laughs> because I like errors, and then it makes me feel smart. If I, but to approach it through common errors. And the first one is to, the tendency to uh, relativize the text. That... It, here you have a text that says, let us not love each other in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. And I can say, well, I, I kind of fulfill that. But John, when you read his whole epistle, he doesn't leave room for kind of. He doesn't leave room for our, our tendency to be content with mediocrity. When you read this book, you see he only has plus and minus. Life, death. Love, hate. Light, darkness. There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. There's no uh, place in the middle that's just good enough. As, uh, as Miss Samantha read this morning, Jesus on the night of his betrayal, with all the things he would want to communicate to his disciples before he goes to the cross, says, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And that's what John is telling us today. That we, our call, our command is to love him. And we do it by abiding in him. Now I should say, it's like the second, second error is to think that this is a, an optional text. Or not for everybody. Maybe it's for the special people that I, I don't want to be the worst, and I can't be the best, so I'll be content somewhere in the middle. But the text doesn't allow us to do that because it is a command. When he says, as we read, let us love, this is not a, a permission or a suggestion or an encouragement. This is a command that he is including himself as a recipient of the command. So he could have said, you love. 
But he still, instead, he says, let us love, meaning, meaning that command is for him as much as it is for us. It's for me as much as it is for you. It's for your neighbor just as in, in you as, as your neighbor. This is a, a, a command of God that he, that he gives. So actually, if you read through this book, there's two main commands in the book of uh, 1 John. And one is, uh, and this is in 1 John 3.23. This is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. And so when we approach this command to love, it is no less a command than it is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all, it, it would be hard to say that God is not commanding everyone everywhere to believe on his son for, for salvation. And the same then is true for the command to, to love. So any integrity, any reading of this text, text with integrity would have to say that this is God's command to me, to love in word and truth. So I say to myself, well, if it's a command and it's a command for me, then it must be easy. So I must be already doing it <laughs> because it's, it's easy or he wouldn't have commanded it. And it, it sounds easy, right? John can say, let us love in, in word and truth as though presto changeo, easy peasy, I got this, there's no problem and I can, I can easily accomplish this. And we may feel like we are accomplishing this until we come across that person that's not quite so easy to love. And we find out that the limitation of my love was I found it easy to love the lovable. They had a hard time loving me, but I didn't have a hard time loving them because they were so easy to love. And then, it, then I come across the one that is, uh, that offends, that injures, that hurts. And then I find that the love that I thought I had wasn't quite up to the standard of God. And this is why this text is so uh, convicting. Because as we read this morning, Jesus commanded his disciples, love one another, and he didn't stop there. Love one another as I have loved you. So all of a sudden, what seemed easy is not easy at all. Because the standard is the love of Christ who poured out his life's blood for people that were rebellious sinners and took, took him to the cross. So in, in 1 John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. So the, the love of God revealed to us is also the standard for the love of God as we deal with with others. So no, I, I believe that John is right, that this is a command of God. I believe that he's right, that it's a command for me. And I believe that it's not easy. 
But the next error is, well, I recognize it's not easy. Therefore, it must be impossible, <laughs> right? So then I'm, I'm off the hook. If this is a, a command that he has no, no confidence or belief that I can actually fulfill, it is a, it is a love requirement that I can't, that I can't meet. And when we start thinking like this, we start thinking that he must be talking of something ideal or in the future. And, and there's, a, there's some truth in that. We see this in 1 John 3 where he says uh, that when, when we see him, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. And the one that has this hope in him purifies himself even as, as he is pure. So there, there is a sense in which the fullness of God uh, awaits. But that doesn't escape, that doesn't give me an escape from the command right now today. And it, it is not enough uh, to speak about love. What does is, what is John say in our text? He said, we we don't love in word. We don't love in a message. We don't work love in tongue. We love in actions, in re real actions. And the example he gives is not that we lay down our life, but we see our brother and sister in need, and therefore we're able to meet that need when we have the resources to do it. So this is not so wild a thing. I mean, we... We often think of, of the measure of love being Jesus laying down his life for us. And that's the case. But his love was shown throughout his entire life of ministry and care of reaching people before he gave up his, his life. Uh, whenever I uh, think of this text of, uh, concerning love, I, I, I can't help. And it, here's, here's how I relate to the young people. In 1960, there was a movie <laughs> from, a, <laughs> from, a, from a book from the 20s of, uh, called Elmer Gantry. Now, if you're old enough, you would know who Elmer Gantry is. He's the epitome of the imposter. He is the phony as, as everything he does is phony. And, and then he, for some reason, he gets called upon and they want him to preach. And he has nothing to say. And he's too lazy to actually do any work kind of like me, but, and, but he finds some poet and plagiarizes it, and the, the poet is waxing eloquent on love, saying, oh, it's the, it's, love is the rainbow after the dark cloud. It's the source of the musician's music. It's the artist's paint. And he waxes like this, and the people say, oh, that's just wonderful. Well, that is exactly what John says you don't do. We don't love in word. We love in deed, in action, in in doing the things that meet the need of the person that's in need. So he, in this, he, he removes all the temptation for flowery talk and asks us to examine our hearts and lives. What are we actually doing? And, and in fact, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if you read through the book of 1 John, you'll find that there's a theological foundation for what he says. And he was dealing with a heresy that taught that Jesus, the Christ, God, the Son, didn't actually come in the flesh. It wasn't real. It had the appearance of it, but it wasn't real. And John said, that is, that is not the Christian faith. That is uh, a, a, that contrary to the Christian faith, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh real. God the Son took real human, uh, human uh, I was going to say human body, but that's true, but that's not all. He, he became a human being in real life. And so when we talk about loving, for John to say that that's uh, just a talk would be contrary to everything that he that he has to say. So here is the, uh, the, the, the basic teaching of the book is the reality of Christ and therefore the reality of how we live in him. 
I had a manager, and we would get together for team meetings every once in a while. And he would always end the same way. And he was an old baseball guy, so he said, he said we, we were going out to you know, face the demands of meeting customer needs and all this stuff, and he would say, see the ball, hit the ball. And so, <laughs> I'm not sure. And, and that's what, but that's what John is saying. See the need, meet the need. Real simple, in real, in real life. And one last, one last and maybe the most dangerous wrong approach. John, I, I believe you. This is a command of God. It's a command to me. It's not easy. It has a standard of the love of Christ poured out for the world. And it is not impossible because it's done in practical, everyday ways. But I have a tendency to think that the measure of the love is the sacrifice of one's life in Christ. And the things that I do are just minuscule in, in comparison. And so I can't really fulfill the command because I'm doing ordinary, ordinary things. And if I'm doing ordinary things and he's calling me to do extraordinary things, then I have to work harder. I have to try harder. I have to dedicate myself more. And, and I find the more I dedicate myself, the more I'm aware of my failure. The, the more I try hard, the more I see I'm the imposter. The more I work, I become more and more disillusioned that I can ever live up to God's, God's standard. And this is, this is the essence of legalism. It is the thinking that I can accomplish God's command by working harder. And this is bondage and it is death. Ray Ortland in, in his commentary on Isaiah said, if you've gone no further than your own legs can carry you, and seen no more than your eyes, your own eyes can show you, and tasted no more than your own thoughts can convey to you, you are lost. And that's, that's how the text reveals, because I try, and I try harder, and I make the commitment, and I determine I'm going to, and always not living up. And this brings us to the essence, I think, of, of the, the epistle. The solution to our need. We have a command. It is real. We're, we're expected to uh, uh, fulfill it in real terms. And we can't do it because we don't have the resources within ourselves to do it. There is a solution. And the solution is Jesus living in us, and we in him. And that's the message of the, of the book. We, we read this text that, uh, dear children, let us not love in word and tongue, but in deed and truth. But if we read that text as though it's a standalone text, we kind of miss the point of the whole book. It's, it's a little bit, I think of it as a, a, as a jigsaw puzzle. Have you ever, you had a bag of jigsaw pieces and somehow you lost the box. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have the box cover so you don't know what the picture is, but you just have pieces. And you can't see what the picture is until the pieces are all joined together. And the same is true with this epistle. 
It's not just love one another. It's, it begins with fellowship that we have with one another. Fellowship that we have with the triune God. It's the coming of Christ and shedding his blood to cleanse and purify. It's him dwelling in us. It's us abiding in him. It's the spirit of God that comes into the people of God. It's the life of Christ lived out in us and we in him. That's the only way that this can be fulfilled is if Christ lives in me and I in him. That's where life is. John calls it eternal life, but that's just not life that's long. It's a different quality of life. It's a life that partakes of the eternal, glorious nature of God, is dwelling in his people right now in Christ. And it's that kind of person, then, that can uh, live according to the commands that he has. We, we live in him. We share his life. He lives in us. There, is, there has to be, when we hear the law of God, and that's what this is, it is a command of God, it is the law of God, that law of God must always point to the one that fulfills the law for us. If it doesn't lead us to point to Christ, then we will be forever the imposter and ever disillusioned and ever despairing. Only in him, when we're born of God, and we abide in him, are we able to walk in him? And you see this in John himself. You remember in the, in the Gospels, what did Jesus call him? A son of thunder, <laughs> right? He's offended by the Samaritans. What does he say? Hey, I got an idea. Let's call down fire from heaven and burn up this village. And, and then in the book of Acts, we see him going down to the Samaritan village to bring, to bring them into the, to the fold of the people of God. He was the one that was, uh, he was the one that was you know, competing with the other ones. Who's the greatest? <laughs> Wasn't it his mother said, hey, let's have one son on your right hand, one on the left. And, and then we come to him in his, in his, uh, in his old age. And I, I, I tried to find out if this is true or not. I'm just going to use it like it is. No, <laughs> but no, there was a, uh, Jerome's commentary in like 400 AD uh, speaks of a tradition concerning the Apostle John. And it, they don't know where the original source is, but maybe it's true. It, it sure sounds like it. But it, he, he writes that the blessed John the evangelist lived in Ephesus until an extreme old age. And his disciples could barely carry him to church, and he could not muster the voice to speak many words. During individual gatherings, he usually said nothing but, little children love one another. And the disciples and brothers in attendance, annoyed because they always heard the same words, finally said, teacher, why do you always say this? And he replied, because it's the Lord's commandment, and if it alone is kept, it is sufficient. If it alone is kept, it is sufficient. And that's what we're looking at. The life of Christ that can transform people into being like him. Our fellowship is, is with him. His spirit is in us. The, the father dwells in the son. The son dwells in us. We dwell in him. We live the life of Christ. And I, I'm reminded of the, the stories we saw in Acts over this series of how uh, one after another they reached out. And I'm reminded that, uh, that when Luke writes the introduction to Acts, he refers to his gospel as the former treaties I wrote to you concerning the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. With the implication is, now that I'm writing the second volume, the book of Acts, I am writing the things that Jesus continues to do and teach. And that's what I see happening in the stories we've seen. It's Jesus reaching out to the woman at the well. It's Jesus in... Uh, in the, the people reaching out to those that have hurt them, persecuted them. It's Jesus in uh, the, John reaching out to the Samaritans. It's Jesus 
revealing himself in a, in a one that will go to the, to the uh, broken person by the side of the, of the road. These, these all are the work of Jesus in his people in the world. And sometimes we might be called to lay down our life physically. But that's not the only thing that love is. I mean, love is asking the new kid in church or school to sit at your table so they don't have to eat alone. Love is, is reaching out to the one uh, with, a, with a need to write an encouraging note, uh, to bring a meal when a family is in crisis, to, uh, to visit someone that's a, a shut-in or in the hospital. That that, it, you might not have to die to do that, but that's, that's the love of God that, that John says you see a need and you're motivated by the love of Christ to meet that, that need. And uh, I, I read recently, and it's almost done, no problem. <laughs> but I read recently a, a book by uh, Chris and Elizabeth McKinney. And the book was called Place for a Purpose, A Simple and Sustainable Vision for Loving Your Next-Door Neighbors. And it, it, what he said in this book is that we have to get rid of the word just because just diminishes something that is actually eternally significant. That is, I, I just said good morning to someone that I don't know. It's just a trivial thing, but it's not trivial. It is the expression of God entering into a neighborhood through you. And they say that your address is not an accident. Your place for a purpose in a neighborhood. And your neighbor's address is not an accident. They're placed in that neighborhood for you to present the kingdom of, of God. And it may take a long, long time of doing little things. I just did this. And we don't see the eternal consequences. They say... The definition of a neighbor used to be someone that you could go to to borrow flour or sugar. They would correct your kids in the street. You would correct theirs. Uh, if they had any need, you would be there. You would join together. Now the definition of a good neighbor is someone that minds their own business and keeps the grass cut. You know? So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, offend anybody. I, I, there was something, I, again, I don't know if this is true or not, but it was on Facebook, so I guess it is. But uh, so a man had a boat in his driveway, and uh, the neighbors didn't like it. It didn't meet their, they didn't live around here. So, I mean, it didn't meet their standards of what a, a yard should look like. So they complained to the homeowners association, don't you even love the idea? Like, they wouldn't go neighbor to neighbor and say, hey, I don't like the boat. They go to the homeowners association, and they, the homeowners association says, you have to build a fence around that boat, right? This is what a neighbor is. You build a fence to cover up the boat. Well, he builds a fence and then paints a boat on the fence. So <laughs> now, that's the neighborhood. But so what they say is that they use the word neighbor as a verb. What does it mean to be neighboring. That's what Jesus asked the, uh, the Pharisee when he told the story of the, the Good Samaritan. He said, which one was the neighbor? It was the one that showed mercy. It was the one that showed grace. It was the one that showed the goodness of God. And in 1 John 4, 8, he says that anyone who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. In 4.19, we love each other because he loved us first. If anyone, anyone says, I love God, but hates his Christian brother or sister, that person's a liar. 
And if we don't love people as we, that we see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their Christian brothers and sisters. Now, this book was written 2,000 years ago. I wasn't available for John to uh, ask what I thought before he sent it out. But if I had been there, I would have said, John, you had this backwards. Because you're telling me that if I don't love the brother and sister that I see, then I can't love God. And I want to tell you, I have a lot easier time loving that God that I can't see than the one that I can see. I mean, there's that old, that old saying, to live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, that's a different story. It, well, John said it isn't a different story. That is the story. That we can't say we love God if we don't love the ones that he loves. We can't say we love God if we don't love the ones that he loves. And I think there's a, there's a value. Because if you'll notice, John doesn't mention the neighbor. In fact, in his gospel, in all his letters, he does not mention neighbor except in the case of the blind man's neighbors verify that he was the one. It's always the brother and sister. And it suggests to me that we learn to love the outsider by learning to love the insider. And that's his call to us, isn't it? To love in word and deed the people that we have joined us together with. In, uh, in the McKinney's book, your address is not an accident. Well, your church is not an accident either. God has placed us here together to learn what love is. And when we withdraw from each other, then we are not learning that lesson. And we may need to know this when it gets harder and harder to love our neighbors. The day could come when we are seen as the enemy of the state and under severe persecution. And if I haven't learned to love my neighbor in good times, how will I learn to love my neighbor in hard times? I, I warned uh, Miss Joanne that I was gonna mention her today I'm going to yell at her. No, <laughs> because she had mentioned something in Life Group one time, or maybe it was somewhere else, I don't remember, about the, the Amish family. There was a school shooting in the Amish school, and some Amish kids were killed. And, of course, the press is all over it. And, and they're asking, say, what they saw was that the Amish family went to the parents' of the boy that had lost his life, giving forgiveness, giving grace, reaching out to meet her needs because she had lost a son too. And the press, of course, they asked, why? How could you do this? How could you give grace and forgiveness to one who, whose son killed yours? And they said, we've been practicing. We've been practicing forgiving. We've been practicing loving. In, 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 in the oppression or the hard things that we go through, we're practicing for the bigger things. And that's what the McKinney's are talking about. The verb neighboring is the, is the revelation of the love of Christ in a, uh, in a family, in a church, in a neighborhood, in a, in a world. And it is... The, the reaching out with the life of Christ. It's not just doing this or just doing that. It's doing this or that with the purpose that Christ would be honored and glorified. And I might never see the results, but, there, but God is doing an eternal work in, in, his, in his people. Uh, I'll close with one, one thing about 
neighboring. So in uh, 2018, there was another school shooting in Florida. And uh, many, many kids lost their lives. And there was a, uh, there was a, uh, I forget what they call him. They have a long name. It's a cop in the school. And uh, he, he, first they thought they were uh, firecrackers, but then they realized it was guns. And he, he had gone out, but he wasn't sure where the shooter was. And it took him three minutes to get into the school because he wasn't sure where the, sh where the shooter was. Well, during that three minutes, 17 kids lost their lives. And this blew up, and the, the, the community was outraged. And even the president called him a coward. And so you have all this attacks of, of the people and the press. Well, this man, it's, it's the worst day in his life as well, and he's, he's isolated in his home. They're, they're afraid to go out. And they, they can't even have peace there because the, the community is there and the, the, uh, the reporters are there and they want to uh, cram a, a camera and a microphone in his face to get the answer and get involved in this. And eventually he's ex 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 exonerated, but that's not the point. The point is they, they have a, you know, a, a, door, a doorbell cam. And so when people came on the porch, it would sound an alarm, and they could look out and see on the screen who it is. And so one day, the, the alarm goes off. The girlfriend goes to the door to look, and, and the fellow says, whoever it is, just tell him I'm not home. Just tell him I'm not home, whatever it is. And she says, it's okay. It's the neighbors. It's Jim and Kelly. And Jimmy Kelly are going not to get involved in the battle and the fight and the recriminations and all of this. They're going to ask, how are you doing? How can I help? And they brought homemade cookies. And you might say, it's just cookies, but it isn't just cookies. It's the love of God revealed to people that are in need and broken. And it doesn't matter if they're in the church in need and broken we give them what we have. Or if they're out in the world or our neighborhood, it is the giving of life. It's the reaching out to the one broken in the street. It's the one uh, with the, the outcast woman at the well. It's the, it's the Samaritan believers. It's, it's Saul, the persecutor, being touched and, and prayed for by Ananias. It's the, it's the people of God treating their brothers and sisters as they would treat Jesus and treating their neighbors as though they're brothers and sisters. And that's what John says. And if we can do that, we will have fulfilled this command. And we will have lived up to the sign that we have on our street corner. Real love, real life, and I'll add, by real faith in the real Jesus. And our Lord and God, we thank and praise you that you loved us. You sent your son to die for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life for us, rebels and uh, sinful, disobedient people. And you not only forgave us, but you drew us into fellowship with you, with the Father, with the Spirit. And we ask your forgiveness that we've bottled these things up in ourselves. We've kept the precious gift of God in our own lives where you wanted to push it out as Jesus lives in us and through us. We ask your forgiveness that we have not lived the kind of life that you purchased for us and that you are accomplishing in us, in your spirit. And for this, we thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Ms. Courtney.